Hey, a friend, Chris here from MyLogicProRules.com, the website that helps you get the most you can out of Apple's Logic Pro. Today, I want to show you how you can integrate your hardware equipment, stuff out of the box, like analog EQs and compressors and all that great stuff into the box, into your projects using an often overlooked plugin, the IO plugin. And all you need really is just an interface that provides you with at least one other output separate from your main speaker outputs obviously outboard gear, and then inputs on that interface. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take our audio from Logic Pro, in this case, a drummer track, and send it out of the interface into the outboard gear, and then from the outboard gear back into the interface into Logic Pro. Now I'll show you how to get all of this set up. Also, how you can commit or print or bounce your hardware effects to your tracks in your projects, and also how to commit your hardware effects to an entire mix. So let's dig into it. Right out of the gate, let's go to the channel strip in the inspector for this drummer track. And we're going to click on the plugin section and go down to utility and IO. And the IO plugin is your ticket to integrating your hardware into your projects. Now it's pretty plain looking and might even seem overwhelming, but it's very simple what each section provides. First, we have the output section, which is our way of telling Logic, hey, For this drummer track, we want you to send this audio out of the interface through these outputs. And then the input section is our way of telling Logic, hey, these are the inputs to expect that incoming audio, that returning audio that's been processed through hardware. Then we have the latency detection, which is very important because once you start to add, you know, external cabling and routing and processing, there could be latency that's incurred just by, you know, sending the audio you know, out of the box. But just by using this ping button, we can tell Logic exactly how much latency is occurring. The IO plugin will compensate for that delay or latency. And then we have the dry wet slider, which allows us to basically blend like a mix knob, how much of our external processing we want to hear in our project. Pretty awesome. And then we have the format for either stereo or mid-side processing. So we're going to stick with stereo. And, you know, first things first, let's just take a listen to this audio with the IO plugin enabled, but we haven't touched anything yet, right? Let's just try to take a listen. Okay, so obviously we can't hear anything, and that's because we haven't told Logic yet where to send the audio and where to, you know, retrieve it. But if we bypass the plugin and then hit play... We hear our drummer track. So we know there's audio. We just need to route it. Okay. So first things first, we're going to route the output. Now I'm using the Apogee Ensemble. It provides me with two speaker outputs plus eight other outputs. So in my case, I'm processing a drummer track. It's a stereo track and I'm going to select outputs nine and 10. These are physical outputs on the interface that we now have to connect to our external hardware. And You know, you can have the I.O. plugin in any format that you choose. It doesn't have to be a stereo I.O. plugin. If we click on it, we can see we're working with a stereo instance because this is a stereo track. But if you have a mono track, you can open a mono instance of the I.O. plugin. Or if you hold option and click, we can swap the orientation of the I.O. plugin or any plugin in Logic Pro from that of stereo to mono. So we could process this track as just a mono instance. Or if it was a mono track, we could switch it to stereo. That's how amazing Logic Pro is. You can literally change the orientation of the track on a per plugin basis. But we're going to stick with stereo. Okay, so now I've cabled 9 and 10 from the interface to my only piece of outboard gear, which is the Art Pro VLA2, a compressor. I'll show you some more complicated scenarios further into the video. Next, we need to choose the inputs. We've now connected the outboard gear outputs to the inputs of the interface of the Apogee Ensemble, and that's going to be analog one and two. So now we just need to detect the latency that's, you know, the amount of time it takes to go from the interface to the outboard gear and back. And to do this, we're going to click on this ping button. Now, I recommend that you mute all of your outputs. I mean, it's not a super loud noise, but it's... You know, it's a pretty sudden like tick that occurs or click, and it could be jarring if your monitors or headphones are kind of loud. I'll just turn everything off, just mute them, and let's hit 
ping to see what kind of latency offset needs to occur. So you can see the audio is passed through. We can see that the click or the pop has occurred on the track. And we can see that the latency offset is now one sample, which would be negligible for just about anybody. But this can add up the more routing and stuff that you add to the signal path. Now, if we've done everything we needed to do to send this drummer track out of the box and back in, we should hear this drummer track when we hit play. Cool, and it's being sent to my compressor. At this point, we want to explore some other controls. The output volume number one, because at the moment, there's no compression occurring on this drummer track. I mean, I'm sending audio out of the box, but there's nothing happening because I haven't hit the compressor threshold yet. So I'm going to set the output volume to plus eight, and this is going to allow me to hit the compressor at the threshold. So now the signal is louder, the compressor is going to react to our drummer track, and we're going to hear that compression impact the drummer track. This output slider is great when you need to gain stage into your external hardware. Then we have the input volume, and I'm going to reduce it by negative eight, just so that when we bypass and reintroduce the I.O. plugin, we're hearing only the effect of the compressor being cut in and out and not just a level boost or reduction. And let's take a listen. Cool, and then obviously we can also blend our compressor to taste. Awesome, that is so sick. I'm now using my outboard gear with my project and the timing has been compensated for, the levels have been adjusted and everything works exactly as we would want it to if we were working out of the box. Now let's explore a slightly more complicated scenario. Okay, so I've gone ahead, I've done some other routing and I've introduced some extra hardware and software into the picture. As I mentioned, I don't have any outboard gear besides that one compressor. So I've plugged the outputs of my compressor into my Symphony desktop interface and I have the Symphony desktop connected to the ensemble via optical ports. And that's how we're adding some extra processing. So we have the Symphony desktop in the signal path and then in the Apogee control software, I've introduced a channel strip plugin and a Pultec emulation just to add some extra crunchiness and boost around 1K. So if we take a listen to our track, take a listen, we'll hear that it's extra crunchy. And you can see that the input has been switched from that of analog 1-2 to optical 1-2. So we have some extra processing, but I haven't made any sort of latency adjustment. And this is on purpose. So everything sounds pretty good, right? But let's set the dry wet slider to about 50% and take a listen to how this sounds. We're gonna hear the dry signal without our external processing alongside 50% of our external processing. Take a listen. Okay, so now things are starting to sound a little phasey when these two signals are being played side by side. And that's because there's some timing that has been changed because of the extra routing. So let's set this back to 100%. I'm gonna turn off all of my outputs just to be safe. And let's press that ping button once more. Okay, so now 15 samples is how much needs to be adjusted on this track to make sure that this track, if it were a full project, it was playing back in time with the rest of the project. Okay, so if we take a listen again at 50%, it should sound a lot better. Awesome, so you get the picture. You set up the outputs, you plug your outputs into your outboard gear, then you plug your outboard gear into your inputs and you set the input and then you detect the latency if there is any latency. You detect it, logic compensates for it. But how do you commit your external processing to your tracks? Because if you just take a look right now, if I bounce this track in place, right, we are not bypassing the effect plugins at all. But if we bounce this in place, there's no audio in the resulting audio file. So 
This is a problem and it gets even worse when you're trying to bounce your entire project out of Logic Pro. Well, that's because external hardware is a processor that requires real-time playback. You can't just bounce a track offline and expect no audio to pass through, but yet somehow the hardware has an audible impact on the resulting file. That's not going to work. So in this case of our track, we're going to set up a send to a bus and we're going to set this to bus four. Now I have a video all about buses and sends and auxes that I'll link in this video. So I'm not going to dig into all of it, but in this case, we're setting a send to bus four and bus four is going to be our road or our pipe or our conduit for sending audio to a new audio track so we can record this drummer track through its outboard processing to a new audio track. From here, I'm going to set the output on the aux to no output. The aux isn't even important to us. All we really care about is bus four, but I'm keeping the aux around just to illustrate how you can set up your sends and buses to kind of react differently to different situations. And we're going to start with pre-fader. Now, if we take a look, I'm going to play back this drummer track and I'm going to start to pan and adjust the fader. And I want you to watch and see how the fader or meters rather on aux four react in relationship to the drums being adjusted. Take a look and a listen. As you can see, I'm balancing the stereo track using the pan knob. I'm adjusting the fader, but aux four, that audio being sent through bus four to aux four has no discernible impact making these changes on the audio that's being sent through that bus. So pre-fader means that anything you do after the plugins has no impact on the outgoing audio through that bus. Now, if we set our send to post-fader, watch this. So post fader, our fader adjustments have a discernible impact, but the panning has no impact. And then lastly, with post pan, here we go. Our pan knob adjustments and our fader adjustments do have an impact. So I'm just bringing this to your attention. Most likely you probably are just going to want to set this to pre fader because Really, all we care about is the plugin processing, but who knows? Maybe you do want to record your fader adjustments and panning adjustments. I'm just bringing this to your attention. Okay, at this point, we can just get rid of aux four. It's of no consequence to get rid of it. All we care about is bus four. And from here, we're going to create a new audio track. And we want to make sure to set the input of our audio track to bus four, that bus that we created. And now we're going to record and able this track. I'll even name it record or print. And then we want to record and able this track. I'm also going to set the output to no output for now, just because in my own tests, even with software monitoring off, we're going to hear double the amount of drummer. It's going to pass through to this track and it's just going to be drummer times two. And it's going to be way louder and I just don't want to listen to it. So I'll record and then I'll set the output back to the stereo output. Here we go. Cool. So we can see we have recorded our drummer track to this new track. And if we set the output to the stereo output, and if we turn off the IO plugin on the original track, I'm going to solo each and we'll go back and forth so we can hear the differences between the two, the original and the now printed version. Awesome. So this is the way that you would go about committing your hardware effects. You have to route the audio from the track through a bus to a new audio track and literally record the resulting audio that you want to capture from your hardware. There's no other process to do this. Otherwise, you can't offline bounce it. So this extends to, you know, bouncing an entire project as well. So if you have 
hardware processing on individual tracks, or even on the whole mix, you need to essentially record or print your entire mix as a stereo file. Now, you could route your audio for all of your tracks, but there's a way easier way. If we go to File and go down to Bounce, Project or Section, in the Bounce dialog, we have an option under Mode called Real Time. And Real Time is literally the playing back of your entire mix in real time to capture the audio that is resulting. So the audio will play through your hardware back into your interface through the I.O. plugin and will be part of the processing of the resulting bounce out of Logic. So let's try it right now. And we'll just call this bounce. Here we go. Awesome. So we've bounced our project to play back in real time. And if we bring in that bounce into Logic Pro, so we can take a look, there is our processing on our resulting bounce. So let's mute everything to be safe. Take a listen. And there it is. Our hardware processing has been committed to our final bounce of our project. So that's the whole workflow using the IO plugin with outboard gear. I hope this has been helpful for you. If it has, as always, I highly recommend subscribing to the channel, Why Logic Per Rules, or subscribing on the website itself, whylogicperrules.com. Every week I'm posting new videos, emails, and posts to help you get the most you can out of Apple's Logic Pro. Thanks so much.